Hey guys, Dr. Childs here. Today we're going to be doing another thyroid Q&A video. Well, I think actually there'll be more than just uh, thyroid questions here, but we're doing another Q&A video. Um, and this is where I answer the questions that you leave for me in the comment section. The reason for this is I, I can provide a lot of answers to questions, but those questions don't always translate to a long video. So it's usually easier for me to answer a bunch of questions um, in this format. So if you have any questions, make sure that you leave them in the comment section below of wherever you are watching this video so that I can get to those questions because the next time I'll do a Q&A video, I'm going to draw from the comments below and we'll be answering those questions. So if you want yours answered, uh, make sure that you leave that in your question in the comments below. So let me share my screen here and we'll go over the comments that were left on my last uh, video that I, the last Q&A that I did. And I'll be trying to go over um, these a little bit faster than I did last time uh, so we can get to more questions. So the first one is, I'm in my mid-60s, 106 pounds, keto for four years, OMAD almost two years, and on Synthroid for five years. On the last blood test, the MCV results were high. Does that affect the thyroid? So I think what you mean, you, you call that mean cell volume. Uh, I think you meant mean corpuscular volume, which is what MCV stands for on the um, red blood cell or the CBC complete blood cell uh, count. So, and then you're asking, is that related to the thyroid? So usually not. In fact, usually the thyroid causes a high MCV through its uh, impact on the decrease absorption of vitamin B12. So as B12 drops, as folate drops, NCV, MCV tends to go up. So it could be related to your diet. I don't know. There's not enough information here to say for sure. Um, but I would look into folate. I'd look into B12 levels and also look into potentially liver damage. So liver, hot, liver damage can also cause an elevated MCV. So that's, that's one. Uh, D Bart says, is intense exercise harmful when you are hypothyroid? The answer is, yeah, it definitely can be. Um, I don't love to recommend patients who are undertreated. I don't love to recommend that these patients do uh, high intensity interval training or any sort of heavy workout uh, type of regimen, at least not until their thyroid is managed. Now when you take, and by managed, I mean taking the right supplements, your thyroid medication dose has been optimized, you're feeling a lot better and so on. But if you're already in a state of hypothyroidism, you're being treated but not treated correctly, and then you try to put excess stress on the body and on the thyroid by increasing the intensity of your workout, it's gonna cause more harm than good to both the thyroid and the adrenals. And I see this sort of thing happen a lot, um, especially in women who are trying to lose weight because low thyroid re leads to weight gain. So these women think, well, if I just over-exercise, then I'll drop the weight. But the problem is that over-exercising drags down the thyroid even further, which, which you know, ultimately leads to more weight gain down the line. You may, you may temporarily lose some weight, but you're not going to um, keep it off. And in fact, you'll probably gain weight um, the longer it goes on. Uh, let's see. Can an underactive thyroid cause heart problems, i.e. skipped and irregular heartbeats? So thyroid can definitely impact the conduction of the heart um, and it can lead to, it depends on how you're defining this. So I would say potentially yes, um, but I would say hyperthyroid is more responsible for that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, it might, it might lead to some things if you have low thyroid or underactive thyroid, but I wouldn't say it's front and center in terms of causes of those, that type of, uh, those type of issues. Dr. Childs, please answer. Should I eat cruciferous vegetables, vegetables and use salt with iodine with a full thyroidectomy? So this, this person's really asking, if my thyroid has been removed, do I really have to use iodine? And if my thyroid has been removed, should I worry about cruciferous vegetables? And what this person is worried about is that cruciferous vegetables contain goitrogens. And goitrogens are things that can potentially harm the thyroid. But if the thyroid is not there, does eating those foods potentially cause any, any problem? And the answer is no. You, should, you can definitely eat cruciferous vegetables if you've had a full thyroidectomy. Um, it's not really going to be an issue. And in fact, for most people, even if you have a thyroid, you should not avoid cruciferous vegetables. They're, they're totally fine. And if you are worried about the goitrogens, all you have to do is steam them and that, re that reduces the, uh, the, the concentration of those things and it's usually fine. Now, using salt with iodine is another question. Yes, you should use iodine. Uh, you still want to be getting iodine from natural sources, even if you don't have a thyroid. This is something a lot of people mess up with. Um, they think, well, if I don't have a thyroid, I don't, I don't need iodine. Not true at all. The, the, because the thyroid is not the only tissue in your body that needs iodine. Remember, other tissues such as brain cell tissue, breast tissue, skin tissue, etc., they all require iodine. So if you think that you don't have a thyroid and you don't need iodine, you're, I mean, it's just that's just uh, wrong. You do still need iodine. So you can get your iodine from salt if you want. Just be careful about the dose. Um, but it's not as it's not it's not as worrisome if you don't have a thyroid anymore because uh, you're not really going to run into overdosing that much because the overdosing generally impacts the thyroid, not the other tissues. So. Um, that's the answer to that. Savannah says, after being diagnosed with Hashimoto's, I got supplements in the way of iodine, zinc, magnesium, uh, B-complex, uh, D3, K2-complex, and a woman's multivitamin. Is it bad to take this many supplements every day? 
Um, no, uh, it's not necessarily bad. That's, that's quite a few that you're taking, I would say, as I'm highlighting here and looking at them. I would say there are better options available to you, but it's not going to be harmful for you to use those supplements. So if you're, if you're not uh, experiencing any benefit from taking them, then I wouldn't continue to take them. Um, that's, I guess that's how I would look at this. Um, but, but by itself, no, that's not necessarily harmful as long as you're taking it away from your thyroid medication if you, if you are taking any, um, because then it would be potentially harmful. But uh, not by itself, they wouldn't necessarily be harmful. The next question is, uh, can my underactive thyroid make me have a fatty liver? Uh, yes, but not directly. So what happens is if your thyroid function is low, that increases your risk of developing insulin resistance and insulin resistance leads or can lead to, or is, you know, potentially the cause behind most cases of fatty liver disease. And that's, that's sort of the idea behind, um, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. So those are things that are related to, uh, obesity and insulin resistance, and your thyroid can make those conditions work or, or make those conditions worse. So in that way, it can kind of in a roundabout way lead to, or at least um, open the gates for that to develop, but not directly. It's not like if you have a thyroid, an underactive thyroid, you're guaranteed to have a fatty liver. That's not really how it works, but but it could in the, in the, um, the scenario that I just described, it could potentially um, make that a little more, uh, occur a little easier, I would say. Let's see, uh, Michaela says, I had my gallbladder removed 10 years ago and I was re recently diagnosed with Hashimoto's thyroiditis. I read that bile salt supplement would help T4 to T3 conversion. Should I take a supplement to help my thyroid? Well, to, in answer to your last question, I definitely think it's a wise decision for most people to take supplements for their thyroid. And the reason for that is simple. Most people are simply being undertreated or treated correctly because the standard of care that most doctors follow to treat thyroid patients um, it's just completely out of date. So in the reason that I think supplements are so effective for this group of people is because it's, they're just not being treated correctly elsewhere. So you can use the supplements to sort of lean on, um, the bad treatments that you are getting. So that's what I'd recommend there. Um, in terms of the bile salt supplement issue that, um, I, 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 I don't do not believe, and I've never seen it be the case that bile salt will leave lead to increased T4 to T3 conversion. Now I can see a way if you're taking bile salts and that's improving gut function, that it could indirectly lead to some improvement in T4 to T3 conversion because it's potentially helping you with um, um, breaking down of certain uh, foods and fats and, and nutrients and increased absorption and so on, improving gut function. But I would say there are much better supplements for that anyway. So I would not recommend the bile salt for that purpose. But yeah, I would definitely recommend using supplements in general. And if you have Hashimoto's, I have a video which talks about the supplements that are designed to increase thyroid function, as well as reduce immune function, or at least balance immune function so that you can get a more um, broad treatment regimen to, to tackle all aspects of Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So I recommend you look at that. Let's see here. What effect might an extremely low DHEA have on, postmenop have on a postmenopausal woman who also has autoimmunity? So, well, I guess, I guess it's sort of a chicken and egg type of question because generally what happens is as women age, and especially those in menopause, though DHEA tends to decline over time through both genders, but especially in women as they reach menopause. Now that decline in DHEA would increase your risk of developing autoimmunity because DHEA has a positive impact on immune balance. But I wouldn't say that the, that, let's say, I guess your question is, it's not the DHEA that has an effect on the autoimmunity necessarily in making it uh, worse, although it could, I would say the way that I would think about this is if you take DHEA, that could be a treatment for your autoimmunity. That's really how I would look at that. But I would also look at your testosterone levels and uh, as well as DHEA, um, estrogen, progesterone, and thyroid, because in menopause, that tends to cause problems in all of those areas. So that's really kind of how I would look at that. But I would say it's more likely that the low DHEA led to the autoimmunity, um, not the autoimmunity to the low DHEA. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, Katie says, hi, how high do antibodies go? Mine have always stayed around 25 to 50 and I've tried to research, but don't have a good reference for range. Also, are there any links between chronic tonsillitis and Hashimoto's or can inflammation be located to just one side of the body? Is that a warning sign for something else? Um, so antibodies can go very high. It depends on the reference range that you're looking at. Um, so the 25 to 50 kind of depends on the units you're looking at. Um, and where you're getting testing, if you're testing, if you're in the United States or if you're in another country. So when, whenever I'm talking about lab tests, you always have to be, be uh, very specific in looking at the units and where you, where you are and what lab uh, you're using to get that test. But yes, they can go much higher in the thousands, um, compared to the 25 to 50 that you're talking about here. If we're talking about getting tested in the United States, I'm not sure, uh, where you're talking about. So I can't really comment, um, on that specific area, but just in general, yeah, they can go much higher than that. And then are there any links between chronic tonsillitis and Hashimoto's? 
Um, I wouldn't say Hashimoto's cause, causes the chronic tonsillitis in any way, or at least that's not something that I've, I, I have seen. But Hashimoto's can lead to inflammation more generally, simply because your immune system is not functioning very well, right? So in general, now, uh, can it be located to one side of the body? That's probably not related to Hashimoto's. Hashimoto's is more of a general sense of inflammation in the entire body. Uh, it's not really isolated to one side or another. It's just a more uh, kind of chronic systemic uh, issue that you're dealing with. So if you have if you have something that's just on one side, that's probably more related to an infection or or some other cause, maybe uh, lymph node related or or otherwise. But I I don't think that those two things are connected probably in the way that you're asking here. Um, hello, please guide me. Can I do intermittent fasting with hypothyroid? So I I think you're asking, is it safe to do intermittent fasting if you have low thyroid or hypothyroidism? And the answer to that is yes, potentially, if it's done correctly. Now, I'm a huge proponent of fasting. I, I love fasting. I love Intermittent fasting, um, well, let me just say, I like all forms of fa fasting. Intermittent fasting, prolonged fasting, well, you know, one meal a day, uh, the time-gated fasting, um, the water fast. I, I like all types of fasting. But they need to be used correctly. Now, I see a lot of people who jump on the fasting bandwagon. They overfast, which is really the same as calorie reduction, which actually harms the thyroid. So you really have to be careful how much you're fasting, what can your body actually take, um, and is it right for you? Do you actually need to do it? Um, so I would look at all those kind of factors. But in general, I would say, yes, intermittent fasting is safe for hyperthyroid patients with the little caveat that only if it's done corrected or, or done correctly. Uh, it kind of depends if you're doing it on your own or if you have a doctor kind of helping you out. Um, I wish I could recommend some doctors that you know are probably knowledgeable on this, uh, but I don't have any off the top of my head. So, but but I would just keep in mind that as you're doing fasting, make sure you're checking your lab tests so that you know you're not actually harming your thyroid function um, in the process. And you can check those, you know, just on occasion. So I think we'll stop there. Um, we did a lot more uh, questions than we did. Or we did a lot more. Uh, we answered a lot more questions than we did previously. So um, if you'd like me to go a little slower and more in depth, let me know in the comments below. Um, but if you prefer the sort of rapid fire going through these uh, more questions with each video, let me know. I want to hear about that as well. And if you have any questions, personal questions, remember, try to not uh, make them personal medical questions. Just make them more broad in general so I can answer them. Uh, these were perfect, by the way. Uh, so keep them sort of in line with the... Uh, in line with the questions that we answered today um, and leave them in the comments below. In the next video, I'll hopefully get to your um, questions. So that's all I have for you guys for now. And otherwise, I'll see you in the next one.